I have been a woodsman my whole life. Growing up in the state of Alaska, I have spent a great amount of time in the wilderness. Countless days tracking down massive bears, moose, and caribou, weeks at a time mushing sled dogs across frozen rivers, and being a guide on the most difficult hunts taught me survival skills that most of my colleagues will only dream of. Which is why I have made a living off the land on a remote homestead in the Matsu Valley south of Denali National Park. Being considered one of the best hunter-trackers in a land full of them is what brought me to the attention of the FBI when they needed a very dangerous animal found and killed. It was a cold winter day when I first met Special Agent Jones. I was just done feeding my huskies their usual mix of hot water, salmon, and the best commercial dog food you can get. Trudging along towards my modest little log cabin to warm my cold body, I heard the whining of a snowmobile engine coming up the trail. It was unusual to hear a snowmobile on a Tuesday, with the weekenders gone home for the time being. So patiently waiting for it to continue west toward town, it suddenly turned north, towards me. Ten minutes later, a smaller man wearing a fishing game winter jacket on a newer trail model pulling into my yard. The dogs, hearing a strange machine pull into the yard, began barking and howling with glee. The man was clearly quite cold, as he quickly killed a two-stroke engine and walked up to me. He pulled off his glove and stuck out his hand. I quickly took his hand and greeted the man. Special Agent Jones, he said. I looked at the man and seen instantly he was out of his element. Cold hands, red nose, and the constant shivers told me everything. So... I said to this ill-prepared man, Come inside, Agent Jones. It's mighty cold out here. Once inside and seated with a cup of coffee, I finally asked, What would an FBI agent want with a bush rat like myself? The man straightened himself and said, The FBI would like to employ your services as a tracker, sir. Huh. Well, I guess I was good at what I do, but I wasn't expecting this. I see. And what exactly do you want me to track? I asked. Well, uh... He stuttered. We're not exactly sure. Not sure, huh? I said, puzzled. He explained what happened. A couple of teenagers were found on the old Pearl River, one with their skull smashed open, and one with his chest crushed. No scratches, bites, anything on them? I asked in bewilderment. Not one. He said. And where the hell is the old Pearl River at? He looked at me goofy and said, Louisiana. I've never been there before. I said. And I don't think I would do much good to you down there. But you will. He assured. We have been searching for the best woodsman in the country. And we found you. He said confidently. I'll be damned if I flew my happy ass up here and froze my balls off on that snowmobile to go all the way back down south and settle for second best. He quipped. Well then, you got yourself a hunter then. I answered. That is how I found myself alongside the old Pearl River, ways deep in the swamp water, sitting next to a swamp man named Shelby. Shelby was an alligator hunter that was hired for the use of his knowledge of the area, and more importantly, his airboat. You boys got anything yet? Said Jake. Jake was a marine scout sniper until he was very recently recruited to be on this task force. Sorry Jake, not shit. I told the sniper. Well, let's pull out for the night. I'm freezing out here and my feet are wet. Jones whined. Fine, was all I said in return. Jones was clearly more of a desk jockey than a field guy. But this was his team, and he was determined to be with us every step of the way. Let's get going then, Shelby whispered. We quietly crept back to the airboat. You're back, said Sarah. Sarah is a cryptozoologist, and Agent Jones said she could be of some help. Yeah, we're back. Only been gone six hours, I retorted. Ignoring my sarcasm, she said, I've been doing some research, and I think I know what we're dealing with. Doubling down on my sarcasm. What, you don't believe what Jones told the public? You know, a bear that crushes people instead of chewing them up. She grinned 
and proudly stated, Nope, not even a little. Shelby fired up the boat, went and picked up Jones and Jake, and we all decided to regroup in the morning. Swamp ape, huh? Jake sneered. Sarah glared at him through her sunglasses, and I spoke. Sure shit wasn't a bear, Jake. You saw the bodies. Yeah, that was an old black bear, was the short athletics man only reply. How do we kill it? Shelby asked. We don't, answered Sarah while staring at me. We trap it, she stated. Right then, Jones got a call and went outside. How in the hell are you gonna trap an 800 pound pissed off swamp monster? Jake intelligently asked. To trap an animal, you must know the animal, what it eats, how it walks, how intelligent it is, the way it thinks, among other things. I informed. Shelby then stated the obvious. So back to square one. Find the damn thing. Just then, Jones came back to the table. We gotta go. Right now. He ordered. I'll explain on the way. Fucking A. Jay cursed as we pulled up to the scene. Eight pigs dead. Five smashed skulls. And three ripped throats. We got out of Shelby's old Ford truck and quickly investigated the scene. They all were killed maybe three hours ago, and large, three-toed tracks with webbed feet were heading towards the swamp. I told Jones that I should start tracking now, and the others should go get Shelby's boat. I can't send someone out there alone. I'll go with you, he said. No, you can't. Someone has to stay and deal with the farmer and the press when they hear about this, I explained. Jake, what about you? Jones questioned. I left my M40 at my room. Jake confessed. What about me? Sarah asked. You ain't got no gun though, said Shelby. I'll borrow your pistol, Sarah replied. Fine with me, I guess. I approved. Jones simply nodded, and Shelby handed her his old 1911. I already had my 45 Colt on my hip. So, I pulled my Marlin 4570 out of Shelby's truck, and off into the swamp we went. For seven hours, we tracked the beast through the swamp. It was clearly quite intelligent, as it made almost no tracks as it moved through the forest, thus making my task very difficult. Finally, as we crept through the swamp, we heard a noise just ahead. I quickly motioned for Sarah to stay still. Then, I saw the monster. It stood approximately 8 feet tall and roughly 400 pounds. The monster's arms had to be at least 5 feet long and the thing was covered in a reddish brown fur. Almost the instant I saw the creature, I smelled it. I had the horrible stench of rotten milk and wet dog. But the thing that seemed the strangest to me was its eyes, red and menacing with a slight glow to them. I put the lever gun against my shoulder and took aim. Sarah squeezed my right arm slightly. Please don't, she asked. I locked eyes with her and lowered my weapon with a slight sigh. The monster let out a deep, loud howl and continued into the swamp. That night, I laid in my shitty motel bed and thought about why I didn't shoot the monster. I mean, I had a clear shot, even if I told Jones that I didn't. In a 4570, I could have dropped it before it knew what hit him. I arrived at the conclusion that I didn't take the shot because Sarah had asked me not to. Sarah, she was that kind of person. This whole time she had been trying to capture it, not kill. Needless to say after that night, I was much more interested in my newfound profession and my new partner. Perfect, said Jones. Hell yeah, Jake agreed. So. He walks in, hits the tripwire, and the gate falls, and he can't get out? Sarah confirmed. Yup, was my reply. Earlier that morning, I had designed a cage trap for our prey. Okay, Shelby, take Jake into the swamp and find a good spot for this thing. You and I will go into town and get someone to start building this thing, Jones stated. What about me? asked Sarah. Find out as much as you can about our little friend 
and we'll meet up when I and Jones are done. Jones simply nodded in agreement with my statement. I couldn't find out much on our buddy, but from what I did find, it seems he's a swamp Bigfoot, but meaner and with some serious B.O. Sarah said as she sat down next to me. She had decided to get a nicer hotel suite, so she wanted to meet me here. In my experience, meaner is really more territorial. I softly corrected it. Either way, at least I'll have you there. She said with a smirk. I'll protect you. I said with a laugh. I don't need your protection. I just know I can run faster than you. She confessed with a laugh. I grinned and looked at the clock. I better get going. I told her. I'll show you the door. She offered. After stepping to the other side of the doorway, I turned to say goodnight. She softly grabbed my hand and said, Thank you for the other night. You know, not shooting. Not a problem. You're welcome. I replied. Good night. She said. Good night, Sarah. You really think it's gonna work? Sarah asked quietly. It will, was all I said in return. The plan was simple. We had figured out it was like a bear in that he likes his food rotten. It was seen digging up those pig carcasses and carrying one back into the swamp. So we dug up the rest and are using them as bait. After about five hours of waiting, the beast finally showed itself slowly sulking out of the swamp, about 25 yards directly in front of Sarah and me. Eyes on, I whispered into the radio to Jake and Jones on the opposite side of the trap. The beast rose up and sniffed the air, looking for danger. A slight snap came from my right side. I looked to see Sarah had tripped, and she was now scared shitless. Turning my eyes back to the beast, I found those big red eyes were locked on me. As soon as we locked eyes, it charged. I had an idea that I prayed would work. I motioned Sarah to stay down and started running towards the trap, 25 yards away. I heard chasing after me, but it was gaining fast. I got directly in front of the trap door. I whirled around to see it had caught up. He leapt towards me, but I dodged him. He spun around to face me and, with his back now to the door, his face was met with the butt of my rifle. He fell backward into the trap, triggering it. The iron gate dropped, locking him inside. The beast let out a roar. A hell of an angry roar that sent shivers down my back. Holy shit! Jake exclaimed, now at my side. Yeah, I said back. Holy shit! The FBI was finishing loading the beast into a truck when Jones approached me. What did you think of the team? He asked. My gaze shifted towards Sarah as she was talking to some agent about the beast. I liked everybody, I answered. Jones, catching my gaze, said with a smirk, Some more than others? My grin was my only reply. Would you be interested in doing some hunts like this one again? Everyone else already agreed. He asked in a more serious tone. I thought for a moment, and then said, Yeah, I'll hunt with you folks anytime. I pulled into the little mountain town at about 10.30am. I looked at the thermostat on the dash of the new Dodge. It read a bone chilling minus 24 below. I pulled into the nearly abandoned campground and found the five Arctic Great Tents that I recommended for this hunt. Me, Shelby, Jake and Sarah would all get one of the four smaller, private tents to ourselves, while Agent Jones would stay in the larger tent that would double as a headquarters and cafeteria for this hunt. I unloaded the 40 huskies out of the custom-built dock box on the back of the Dodge and set up a lean-to structure that would serve as their house for the next couple of weeks. I then made my way to the HQ tent and checked the fire burning in the wood-burning stove. It was nearly out. I mentally questioned my team's basic winter survival abilities while I patiently built a roaring fire to warm the tent. I was enjoying the warmth of the fire when I heard the black SUV pull into the campsite. Whoa, nice ride, Jake commented on the new truck. I thought you drove an old Ford. Sarah questioned. I did. I replied while looking sharply at Jones. Jake, putting two and two together, 
and jokingly questioned, You bought him a truck? Where's my bonus? Jones, always serious, answered, I, uh, we, we needed dogs then. Do you know any other musher with a security clearance? Shelby then broke into our conversation. Come on, the pizza is getting cold. We went inside and ate. Then Jones broke the small talk. We all knew why we were here, but Jones finally explained in detail what happened. Turns out that a group of five snowmobilers went into the backcountry for a weekend trip. They were found dead the following Tuesday, or should I say, what was left of them was found dead. The bodies were severely mutilated, eaten by some strange beast. The bodies were found in their campsite, which had been completely trashed by whatever had done this. All five snowmobiles were found at the campsite unharmed, in operating condition, meaning that whatever happened, it happened so fast that they couldn't run to their machines to escape. There were no tracks found due to high wind having blown away the tracks. The locals had removed the bodies, but had not disturbed anything else, so we decided to head to the crime scene early the next morning to assess the situation properly. At daybreak, I hitched teams of dogs to the four dog sleds I had brought with me. Two racing style sleds to be used to move quickly if needed, nicknamed the Corvette sleds by Jake. A large frightening style sled for moving bulk gear, the trucker sled, and a multi-passenger touring style sled, the station wagon. I gave everyone a crash course in duck mushing and assigned everyone a sled. I was to lead the way on a Corvette sled, followed by Jake on the trucker sled, then Jones and Shelby on the station wagon, then Sarah in the rear on a Corvette sled. The trip was pure hell for me. Jake complained constantly about not getting a Corvette sled, and Jones couldn't keep from falling off. Shelby grumbled non-stop about the cold. In fact, the only person who seemingly enjoyed the trip was Sarah, who learned the difficult task of steering the sled with ease, never once complaining. She was pretty impressive for a rookie musher, and I'm not easily impressed. We arrived at the murder scene after a couple of hours. They had picked a good spot for a camp, surrounded on three sides by trees, but still in the heart of the mountains, perfect riding country. I quickly surveyed the small campsite. There were three small arctic grey tents, equipped with small propane heaters for warmth. Apparently, the victims had been a group of two women and three men. The tents were collapsed from the snowstorm on the night of the murder, but upon entering the last semi-standing tent, I found about a dozen beer cans scattered on the floor of the tent, with another twelve pack in the corner. I kicked around in the snow and found the remains of a campfire. It had burned to nothing but ashes, telling me it had burned out on its own and was not put out, so the campers must have been awake at the start of the attack. Jones approached me. What do you think happened? Whatever it was hit so hard and fast that they couldn't even get to their snowmobiles, and it didn't help that these folks were probably drunk, sitting around the campfire, not paying attention. After a brief silence, Jones spoke up. I got a couple of things to fill out here, and I want to take some pictures of the scene. I thought of the best thing to do and responded. I'm gonna go search around over there in the trees. The wind wouldn't have hit them so badly, and maybe I could find some tracks. The group of trees was roughly a thousand yards up the mountain to the north, further away from the town in the valley below. The most likely spot for a animal to retreat to. Jones looked at the trees and replied, Dim trees look a good distance away. Take your radio and Jake. I nodded in agreement and found Jake sitting on one of the dog sleds. Hey Jake, you want to take a look up there in those group of trees? I said, motioning to the said trees. He slowly rose from his seat, glanced up at the trees up ahead and said, Sure, I guess. You got your rifle? I casually asked. Nah, I left it back in my tent. He answered. Got a sidearm? I questioned, hoping he wouldn't have been foolish as to come to the backcountry unarmed. Yeah, I got my Glock. He answered. Oh, okay. Do you carry a 40 SW or 45 ACP? I curiously replied. 9 by 19 millimeter parabellum. What about you? He asked. 9 millimeter? What the hell are you gonna do with a 9 millimeter? I asked, quite aggravated. What do you mean? He asked, completely bewildered. I mean, we're not fighting people. 
Whatever we are hunting out here, rip three people apart before any one of them could do a damn thing about it. You think you're gonna put what did that down with something that takes multiple shots to kill a person? I stated, now quite angry at his ignorance. He returned my anger in kind. Go to hell, Josh. Who the hell do you think you are? I'll carry what I damn well please. You like to walk around like you're in charge or something, but hear me now. You ain't my superior. For a moment, I considered knocking his teeth out for his ignorance and attitude. But before I could act, Jones stepped between us. Settle down, you two. He said angrily. I didn't make this team to fight against ourselves, damn it. He shouted. Pausing for a moment, then continuing. Shelby, why don't you go with Josh? Fuck that, God damn it. Jake responded. Jones looked at me for confirmation. I just nodded once. Jake, go ahead and jump on Sarah's Corvette's lead. The snow is hard on top, but icy. We'll have to put booties on the dogs to protect their feet. I directed Jake. He nodded once in confirmation. I quickly put the booties on the dogs and looked up to see Jake on the runners of his sled. And off we went. We arrived at the tree line and quickly anchored off the dogs. I walked over to help Jake and seen a small speck of blood on one of the leader's paws, also noticing that one of her booties was missing. God damn it, I said with clear aggravation. What? Jake asked. Upon closer inspection, I found he had put several booties on wrong so that they could easily fall off. You put the damn booties on wrong, I answered. Excuse me, Jake said sarcastically. I shook my head and replied. If I had fixed it, would have worked better. Kiss my ass, was his reply. I started to head into the woods, and he soon started to follow. We searched for a couple of hours in an uneasy silence, until I found a track. Hey, come here. I motioned for Jake. What in God's name is that from? He asked. I don't know, I said. The track was about two feet long and one foot wide, with long toes ending with six inch long claws. They were fresh, fresher than they should have been. They're heading north, I said. But I want to see where they came from. Follow the tracks backwards to find out, I told Jake. Sure, he answered. And take my rifle. Wouldn't want this thing to shove that nine mil up your ass, I mocked. Ha ha. Fucking funny, he replied, obviously annoyed. I began following the tracks northward, chuckling lightly to myself. What kind of fool would come up here with a damn pea shooter? Jake didn't strike me as an idiot, but now I found myself questioning my teammate. Even if he carried a small pistol and an adequate rifle, he would at least be able to walk safely. But no, the dumbass left his rifle at camp. So now... I am left with nothing but my 45 Colt, while adequate, it lacked the range and sheer knockdown power of my 4570. My internal rant was interrupted by the slightest movement out of the corner of my eye. I quickly spun towards it, crouched, and focused my sight on it. The beast was climbing up a steep bluff 250 yards to my 10 o'clock. It was too far to accurately tell, but it looked to be at least 10 to 14 feet tall with what looked like three-foot antlers growing from its head. It finally reached a small ledge and stood, looking at the valley below him. I slowly pulled my pistol from its holster, knowing it would be useless at this range, but the familiar weight in my hand was reassuring. The beast luckily did not see me and turned and ducked into a low cave. I quickly made my way back down the mountain with extra caution. Finally, I made my way to the two parked dog teams where Jake was waiting for me. Where the hell have you been? He questioned, handing back my rifle. I saw it, I replied. Seen what? He asked with curiosity. To hell if I know, I replied. We quickly readied the dogs and made our way to the ruined campsite where everyone had been waiting. Upon our arrival, Jones started questioning. You two get lost? No, we found something. I replied. Found what? He asked. Tracks. Coming from that ridge. 
Jake answered, pointing to a tall bluff about a mile to the west. Fresh, only about an hour too old. I added. My guess is you followed them? Jones asked me. Yeah, I followed them. I answered. What did you find? He asked again. I don't really know. I answered. He quickly nodded. Sarah? He yelled. I quickly described the creature to Sarah while we packed our gear to go, answering any and all questions she had. Then, we quickly returned to our campsite. I started a fire in Jones's tent while Sarah started to research what I had seen. I decided to ask Jake more about what he saw. Hey Jake, you mentioned that you followed the tracks that led to that ridge. What can you tell me about them? I asked. Yeah, them tracks led right to that ridge and... Well, it looked to me like it was. Watching, he answered. Watching us, huh? It must be pretty smart, I stated. Wonder why though? Jake asked no one in particular. When wolves return to a kill, they'll sit back and watch before they'll come back in on the carcass to make sure that nothing had disturbed it. If they see something wrong, they'll leave it alone. Too risky for them, I answered. Yeah, if this thing is anything, it's smart. Sarah commented as she re-entered the tent. What do you have on it? I questioned. It's pretty scary. From what you described to me, I think it's what they call a windigo. Sarah answered. What's a windigo? Jones asked. I have heard a little from some of the native guides. They say a windigo is like a spirit of the forest or something. They say that a windigo represents the evil of cannibalism. That if a person eats another, they become a windigo. They say that a windigo can drive a man mad and then possess him, making him crave human flesh. A windigo can often represent extreme hunger, cold, and any sort of evil really. But I was always told it was just a legend. I informed the group. But our body didn't possess anyone, and nobody ate no one, so that doesn't cover it. Shelby pointed out. Science tells us that most legends are really just exaggerated versions of the truth. Sarah said. From what I've learned about them is that they are a lot like the Yeti, but a thinner, taller version. She added. So, Bigfoot's Eskimo cousin? Jake asked assuredly. Pretty much. Sarah confirmed. So how do we trap it? Jones asked. It's a cave-dwelling creature, so the thing to do is wait until it leaves its cave, set your trap in the cave, and simply wait until it returns. One problem though, I stated. What is it? Asked Jones. The cave trap method. It works with a bear or wolf when they leave to go hunting, but this thing leaves to hunt people. I answered. We'll close the whole area to people. Blame avalanche danger or something, said Jones. Josh, draw up some design for a trap. I'll have a local start building it immediately. Then, I need you to head out into the back country and tell everyone to go home. I don't need anyone else getting killed. Take someone with you. He issued me the order, and I simply nodded my head and went to work. It was a good plan. I drew up an easy design for a large cage trap and sent Jones on his way. I thought about who to take and quickly decided on Sarah, as she was the best musher of our team, making for a much quicker trip. Sarah, you busy? I asked. No, not really. Why? She answered. I need someone that can actually ride a sled to help me evacuate the area. I was wondering if you would come. I said. Sure. Let me grab my gear. She said. She went into her tent, then we emerged a few minutes later with her winter gear and a pistol on her hip. What are you carrying? I asked. Oh, just my dad's old 357 Mac. She answered nonchalantly. I smirked to myself as we were heading out, knowing Jake would be embarrassed to know that even inexperienced Sarah knew to carry a large pistol. We searched the surrounding main countryside. We found a few different groups of snowmobilers and sent them home. Some gave trouble, but no one argued once I showed them my FBI badge Jones supplied me. 
things took a drastic turn when we were on our way back to camp. We were mushing along a trail that ran on top of a steep bluff that sloped down into a heavily forested valley and eventually a frozen river. This is where we saw it. The beast was following the river north, the opposite way we were traveling. I stopped the team and anchored the still fresh dogs off to a nearby tree, quietly instructing Sarah to do the same. Do you see it? She whispered. Yeah, I responded, pointing at it through the various trees. I retrieved my rifle and my binoculars from my sled back to try to get a better view. As I said, the creature was heading north along the river, so I figured that it was probably leaving its den. As its den was located to the southwest of our position, it was probably hungry and looking for food. I couldn't find it. You got your phone? I asked. Yeah, she answered. Call Jake and Shelby. Tell him to haul ass out here. I commanded. What about Jones? Sarah asked. Call him after Jake. I answered. What are you gonna do? She asked. This thing is killing and eating people. I've got no choice. I answered. She nodded her head slightly in approval, although I knew she was disappointed. I know. She sighed. I quickly found the creature in the valley below, still oblivious to our presence. The wind was coming from the northwest, definitely in my favor. I strapped on my snowshoes and began descending down the cliff. I made my way down along the river and suddenly started north. When I last saw the beast, it was a little over a mile ahead of me, but because the snow was deep, it was moving slowly, much slower than me with my snowshoes. It took me over an hour, and it was almost dark when I found it. It had stopped at an unfrozen spot of the river to get a drink when I spotted it. So, I silently laid on the ground and slowly crawled through the snow, its cold stinging my face to a nearby ice-covered lock. I steadied my rifle on the lock, taking aim, then slowly cocking the rifle's hammer with a metallic click. The beast must have heard the click, because... It suddenly turned and stood just as I fired. The bullet hit the animal in the upper hip, knocking it to the ground on its stomach. The creature let out a pain towel as it struggled fruitlessly to get to its feet. I rose from my shooting position and approached the beast intending to put the damn thing out of its misery. Just as I shouldered the rifle and worked its lever action, I heard Sarah scream. Wait! She yelled. I turned and looked down the river to see Jake and Sarah about a hundred yards away, approaching quickly on the station wagon. They pulled up beside me and stopped the sled. Trank darts, Jake said, holding up an air-powered dart gun. He walked over and shot the animal with one, and within a couple minutes, it was out like a light. Do you think it will live? Jake asked. It should. I shot it in the hip, I answered. Yeah, about that, Jake said, smirking. It moved at the last second. I explained. Uh-huh, Jake answered, still smirking. At least I bought my rifle. I retorted it with my own smirk. Okay, fine, Jake said, chuckling slightly. How are we gonna get this thing out of here? I wondered out loud. Jones is on his way with a helicopter and some agents. They'll take it from here, Sarah answered. Two hours later, I was helping to load the still sleeping cryptid in the back of a semi-truck to be hauled off to. Who knows? After we finished up, Jones approached me. You did another excellent job here, Josh. He complimented. Just doing my job. I answered. So, can I count on you for more hunts in the future? He asked. Of course. Anytime.